Well, hi there. Um, great to be here again. Um, hello to everybody on this Sunday morning, especially um, to Flame, um, the primary school age group. Uh, we loved seeing you at the Flame Zoom party uh, last week. And this George Muller story is really for you guys because we started this in February and then because of the lockdown, we had to finish. So really, this is this story is for you. I know it's got a bit long and a bit detailed, but hopefully you're, you're getting the hang of what's what's happening and what's what's up with George Muller. So last week we looked at him as a middle aged man. Um, and we heard how he'd been sending out these narratives, these stories, these answers to prayer um, across the UK, and they were starting to go across the world. There was amazing travel opening up, up at that time, and uh, the, um, things could be sent out more easily. Um, and we heard how that story, that those narratives um, reached Ireland, and some young men got hold of them, some fervent Christian young men, and they began to say to God, oh, Lord, if you could answer George Muller's prayers like you do, then you could answer our prayer. If we're praying for spiritual things, for a pouring out of the Holy Spirit, a turning back to God. Um, and God did hear their prayers, did answer. And there was this incredible 1859 revival. Uh, we heard last week how there were so many people trying to get into the churches that an act of parliament was passed so that they could preach the gospel, the message of Jesus on the Sunday nights in the West End theatres. Um, those theatres became filled up with people. They reckon in that winter of 1859 to 1860, about a quarter of a million people heard that these messages on the Sunday night um, in those theatres. And then the revival reaches um, Ashley Down itself. Um, George Muller said there was a mighty working of the Holy Spirit among the orphans at the end of January and the beginning of February 1860. We heard last week how that began among the, the girls in the orphanage and how many of the orphans, many of these children and young people, very seriously in their heart turned towards God. By 1870, there are five orphan houses that have been built um, with, a, with a, a capacity for 2,050 orphans. This is all standing up on this hill, this slope out uh, on the outskirts of Bristol. Um, they were very well run. They were meticulously um, looked, or all the administration was meticulously done. Um, that he even, Muller even employed an inspector, apparently, their own inspector who inspected through the buildings and uh, amongst the work with the children. At that time in the UK, there were 25% of the workforce was made up of uh, 18s and under. So a quarter of the people working were children and teenagers out in factories and mills, uh, agricultural workers, um, and... Um, Muller wanted to work to help the orphans, not just while they were with them, but beyond that. So the girls, we've got a lovely picture of the girls walking in front of one of the orphan houses. The girls were trained up to help look after uh, younger ones. They were educated. Um, they were trained in needlework and all sorts of things. And then um, they, at, at 16, 17, they were placed usually into families where they often went into uh, what we would call now, we call it domestic service. Um, they, they became maids and servants and they became, um, they must have worked work to become uh, assistant cooks and all sorts of things uh, in these homes. Many of the homes they went into were Christian homes. And then the boys, we've got a great picture of the boys out on the hill. Uh, these are some of the boys. So they left at 14, different kind of world then, um, and they were apprenticed. They went into apprenticeships um, and they were given when they left uh, a toolbox. And we've got a picture of a wonderful Victorian toolbox um, so that they had this with them to take as they were apprenticed into all sorts of kind of trades. And they, they didn't let them leave until this was all lined up for them. They cared for them beyond the years in the orphanage. And at the end, when each child left or young person, um, they were given also a tin trunk and in that trunk were two sets of clothing. Um, and then something else happened, and I love this. Um, the children uh, would be given two things, one in each of their hands. So the first thing they'd be given was, um, let's do this the right way around, a Bible. And it probably would have looked a little bit like this. It probably would have been in a case. Let me see if I can open this. 
Oh, I can. This is 100 years old, this one that I'm holding up and showing you. And it, theirs would have looked a little bit like this. This is actually from a, a ragged school. There it is. And there would have been an inscription on the inside, probably like that. And then there might have been wonderful pictures and things we don't know. Um, but they were given a Bible, and that Bible was put in their right hand. Um, and then they were, something was put in their left hand, and this is what it was. It was a coin. Now, we're not sure what coin it was. Uh, there's a picture of a coin. I don't know if you can see that. That's from 1893, when Muller was still alive. Uh, maybe he handled that coin. Probably not, but you never know. Um, so that's a half crown, which is actually worth about 30p, as it were, if you convert it over. But in those days, it would have been worth about 35 to 40 pounds. Um, and that was given to them. And he said to them, hold the coin in your left hand. Hold the Bible. Here it is in your right hand. And he said, if you listen to and you love and you follow and you hold on to what is in your right hand, the Bible, God will take care of what is in your left hand, your money and your finances. So that's what happened when they left. And I, I really love that story. So in eight, by 1870, the fifth house had been completed and then in a way, real tragedy came, real sadness, which was that Muller's wife of 40 years, she was called Mary, Mary Muller, um, died in February 1870. He said they were, this is his words, unite, their united object was to live only and wholly, meaning completely, for God. They often prayed together each day. She was an amazing woman. She was um, well-educated. She was a fantastic mathematician. She did all the books. She was the finance manager, really, of the Muller, of the Muller orphanages. Um, and she also was amazing with material and needlework. And she organised all the sheets and the, uh, all the laundry and the uh, clothes that they wore. She understood about material. Um, and... Muller did what he had learnt to do. Do you remember we've talked about this? Uh, that in the times of trial, in the times of difficulty, instead of turning away and saying, oh God, why has this happened? This is terrible. He turns his eyes onto Jesus. Um, he doesn't... Um, he doesn't harden his heart and he says, God, I, I accept this. I thank you for my incredible wife. And she died on the Sunday morning and on the Monday night was the prayer meeting and he goes to that prayer meeting and someone who was there and wrote an account of it said that he came and his face was shining and he said I want to thank God for my wife I want to thank God that he's rescued her from her suffering and I want to thank God that she is happier now than she's ever been um, and he worshipped God that night which was so typical um, of how he had lived and how he was living. He was left with a daughter uh, called Lydia, who married, and we've got a wonderful picture, the following year in 1871, she marries a man called James Wright, who was a fantastic team member um, of the at the orphanages. Um, and uh, she, she, they, they were running the orphanages with him. Uh, sometime after that, he remarries. Uh, here's a picture of his second wife. She's called Susanna Grace Sanger. Um, and then age 70, we've got this lovely picture of him as an older man. I think he's probably more than 70 in this picture, but he's such a smiley gentleman. Uh, he began to do, we mentioned this last week, something he'd always wanted to do. And he'd always wanted to become a missionary. Um, in a way, he was a missionary because he'd come from Germany, but he began to travel. Um, he was famous, uh, famous among Christians. He was known among Christians. That's a better word um, for sending out of the Bibles, the link with the revival, the orphans, the missionary work. And people wanted to hear him. They wanted to meet him because they knew about him. And so in 1875, age 70, with his wife, on March the 26th, he sets out um, on these missionary journeys set out we've got a lovely picture of a boat this is one of the actual ships ship is a better word than boat this is one of the ships he went on um and this ship is called the ss sardinia um, and there's a wonderful story of what happened on that ship i'm just going to quickly read this brief account to you once while crossing the atlantic on the ss sardinian in august 1877 muller's ship ran into thick fog 
Muller explained to the captain that he needed to be in Quebec in Canada by the following afternoon, but Captain Joseph Dutton said that he was slowing the ship down for safety and that he was sorry, but Muller would have to miss his appointment. So George Muller asked to use the chart room, where they kept all the charts, to pray for the lifting of the fog. And the captain followed him downstairs, claiming it would be a waste of time to pray. Can you imagine saying that to George Muller? After Muller prayed a very simple prayer, the captain began to pray, but Muller stopped him, partly because of the captain's unbelief, but mainly because Muller believed that his prayer had already been answered. Muller said, Captain, I've known my Lord for more than 50 years, and there is not one instance that I have failed to have an audience with the king. Get up, Captain, because you will find that the fog has gone. When the two men went back to the bridge, they found the fog had lifted and Muller was able to keep his appointment. The captain became a Christian shortly afterwards and was always then known as Holy Joe. His name was Joseph. So he and his wife travelled out. They travelled and spoke to, at packed meetings. Amazingly, they even travelled to China, which must have been amazing for him because he had been involved in some way. He was instrumental in setting up, in, in, in triggering the setup of Hudson Taylor's uh, China Inland Mission. We've got a wonderful world map picture here. He travelled to 30 countries over 17 years, travelled 200,000 miles and had a real impact on the Christians worldwide. And the reason he wanted to travel was exactly the same reason as he'd wanted to set up the orphanages. He wanted to show a doubting world uh, that the living God was real. So that was why he was traveling. Uh, those were his motives in going out on these amazing missionary journeys. And then um, after 17 years, he's now age 87, and he and his wife return. Uh, they, they, they draw the travels to a close and they return to Bristol. Um, he's now influenced people, uh, perhaps many thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands uh, across the world. Um, but one of my favourite individual stories is of a man who lived in a suburb of Bristol or part of Bristol called Hawfield. And from his house, this uh, Victorian man could look up uh, and see those orphanages on Ashley Down. Um, and he said that when he felt downcast or despairing or he doubted that God was there to help him, he would look up at night and he'd see the lights in the windows uh, shining out of the orphanages. And he said they seemed to him like stars in the sky. And he would remember that there is a living God uh, who Miller, Muller had proved um, and that that living God cared for him. So next week, oh, very sad, we draw, we draw the story to a close um, and it's a very beautiful last part. So we're just going to pray. Uh, Lord God, we thank you uh, for your incredible mercy, kindness towards us. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord and he made heaven and earth. We praise you that uh, Muller's help came from you and our help comes from you. Lord, we ask again, would you help us? Uh, to turn in our hearts towards you when things are difficult and hard. Do you help us not to harden our hearts in the day of trial, uh, but to lift up our eyes onto Jesus like George Muller did um, and to lift up our eyes to heaven and to remember that our help comes from you. Amen. Amen.